Hi everyone, PV here, and welcome to my new YouTube video. And today we're going to do something a little bit different than we usually do. We're going to do a gameplay video uh, where I selected uh, the most interesting game from my MPL split last weekend, uh, and then we're going to go over the game and talk about the interesting decision points. And the reason I chose this particular game is because I believe it illustrates a concept that I think is very important, and that is that there are also decisions that you have to make with an aggro deck. Uh, so there's this, uh, you know, idea that control decks are hard to play and aggro decks are easy, and that's just not true. And I think for a lot of the time uh, there are control decks that are easy and there are control decks that are hard. Uh, there are aggro decks that are easy and there are aggro decks that are hard. But even if you happen to be playing one of the easy ones, I think Gruul was overall not a hard deck to play uh, in Historic, uh, you still have to pay attention to what you're doing. There is still a lot of agency um, that you have over the course of the game. Uh, so this is going to be uh, a game where I'm playing Gruul. Uh, in Historic, right? But the idea isn't necessarily to talk about Gruul in Historic, it is to go through the decision making so that you can apply the same sort of decision making, whatever format it is that you're playing and whatever deck it is that you're playing, but most specifically for aggro decks because this is what we're going to focus on. Before we start, I'm going to talk a little bit about my Gruul deck, uh, but I'm not going to go super in-depth about it because, again, the goal of this video is not to talk about Gruul. It is to talk about the gameplay situations that happen in my game. But just to give you some context, uh, this is historic. Gruul is a pretty straightforward deck, I think. Uh, it is mostly just playing creatures, attacking, and pumping them with Embercleave or Oasis. Uh, there's not that much finesse in the deck, I would say, especially in game one. Uh, my version is a little bit different than others, and that's because I don't like Electric Company that much. And the reason I don't like Electric Company that much is that I don't feel this deck utilizes the random bodies late in the game that well. Right? If I play Electric Company in a gen deck, I have irreplaceable cards that I'm trying to find, you know, Mayhem Devil, Wolf Strider. But I'm also happy if I just find, you know, two random creatures a lot of the time. Getting a, a cat and a Dreadheart Butcher uh, could be enough, right? Because I have all the sack outlets, I have all these synergies. So you're always getting something that matters if you get something. With Gruul, you have more hits, but a lot of the hits don't count for anything. Because if you play Eclectic Company on turns 4 or 5 or 6, and you hit Lenore Elves and Burning Tree Emissary, these cards don't do anything at that point in the game. So it's basically like you missed. Uh, so I prefer uh, just having an Ember Cleave or having a Questing Beast, uh, and just knowing that my 4 mana card is going to do something great. And most of the time, I would rather have an Ember Cleave in my hand in game 1 than uh, you know, two 3-3 three, three creatures, or a 4-3 and you know, a 3-3. Three, three. Just the Ember Cleave is just a more important card. Uh, so that's why I only play one Eclectic Company, even though everyone else plays 4. And this particular game is my game three against Kenyu Kohiro, who is playing a deck that you've probably never seen before. I certainly hadn't seen before. Uh, it's a Timur Landfall deck, uh, which is sort of a cross between Soltai, uh, Midrange, and Gruul Aggro. So he has cards like Uro, Nisa, and Krezis, uh, but also cards like, you know, Gruul Spellbreaker and Glorybringer. So it's a deck that I had never played against before. Uh, and this is game three. But as you will notice, I just resubmitted my deck. So I, I submitted exactly the game one configuration that I, I had because I just didn't really know what to do against him. And it felt like none of the cards that I had were actually good against both his plans. Uh, so I wanted, yeah, I want Red Cat Melee to deal with the Gruul Spellbreaker. And I want the Garruk to deal with, you know, Anger of the Gods. But they're really bad versus the, the counterpart, like the, the other side of the coin. So I decided to just make my deck as efficient as possible and just resubmit my game one deck. Uh, Kenyu Kohiro, however, did not resubmit his game one deck, so uh, this is the version that he's playing in this particular video. So I, I, got, I got to go to this video and see how he sideboard, and this was how he did. So this is the deck that I'm playing against. It's one and one, and now this is game three. So the start of the game, um, we're in the play because we lost game two, and our hand is okay, right? It doesn't have, you know, one of those explosive draws that puts eight power in play by turn two, but it does have a reasonable curve. I have good cards to play on turns two, three, four, uh, you know, and, and five at this point if I draw an extra land. Uh, so I'm, I'm feeling like I'm in a reasonable spot here. Uh, the early turns of the game are a bit scripted, right? There's not much going on. He gives my ooze, I attack, I play a Mammoth, he plays a 4-4. Uh, you see now the, the Spellbreaker, right? So, uh, which means that at this point, I can't attack unless I draw a land. I don't, so I just play, uh, you know, the Lunar Elves and the Bell Collector. And that, that's where we are, right? The, anyone would have gotten to the same spot. Now, uh, the game becomes a lot more interesting. Uh, because we, we get to a spot where he plays, you know, scavenging news and passes with blue and green up. And we know that his deck, for instance, he has four Aethergust and three Abrade, right? Uh, he tapped the red mana, so Abrade is not a card that we're worried about right now. 
Uh, but it is reasonably likely that he has Aetergust, uh, based on, you know, he has a bunch of cards in hand and didn't do anything else. Uh, and uh, even though it's not a given that he has Aetergust, it is uh, relatively likely, right? So I don't want to make an attack that punishes me a lot if he does have Aetergust, right? Uh, even if it's just 50-50, I feel like my position is reasonable enough that I don't have to do that. So I don't want, for example, to attack my Burning Tree Emissary or my Power Collector, uh, not, not the Power Collector, just the Burning Tree Emissary, uh, into the Rule Spellbreaker and have my opponent uh, just, you know, play play the Aether Gust on my Amber Cleave and then just eat my creature for free. I don't want this to happen. Uh, so what what is my alternative here? Uh, I can play I can play the Questing Beast, right, uh, and then attack with both the Mammoth, which will be a five five, and the Questing Beast. And I I think this would be a reasonable play because it grows the power collector as well. The power collector is be a 3-3 at the end of all of this. Uh, I'll deal a lot of damage. I'll get rid of that 4 4 that is, you know, holding down the fort. But there is one huge problem with this line. Uh, and the problem is that I don't actually want to have this trade. I don't want to trade the Questing Beast for the Spellbreaker because my opponent has Scavenging Moose. But right now, the Scavenging Moose is only a 3-3, right? Because I have my own Scavenging Moose in the graveyard. But if this trade happens, the Scavenging Moose will grow into a 5-5. Five five, and that is a much, much bigger problem. So I think here, uh, I, I can't play Questing Beast in attack because I just don't want this to be the case, right? I don't want this to happen. Uh, so what do I want to do? Well, I think just play a land, attack with the Mammoth, uh, and then play the Questing Beast post-combat, right? So my opponent doesn't know. I still have Embercleave Mana if my opponent decides to do something, right? If my opponent decides to, you know, double block, and then maybe I can kill the Ooze. Um... And then they might just exile my ooze to gain a life. And at that point, I still have the ability to play the Ember Cleave, right? Uh, because then they'll, they'll spend their mana. So this is the key The key part of the, the play here, is, is identifying two things. First, uh, that I don't want to expose my Ember Cleave to an Aetergust right now, because I think this would just not be very productive uh, for me. It would basically, you know, waste my turn and have something bad happen. Uh, or, alternatively... Uh, I also don't want to trade the Questing Beast for the Gruul Spellbreaker. I think a lot of people would have made this trade, uh, but I think it, this trade would be incorrect. So I think I, I fought for a very long time, and this is what I did. So I attack, play my Questing Beast post combat, and then my opponent just uh, passes the turn right without doing anything. And then I have another choice. Right now I have uh, open mana. I can just attack with everything. Uh, and depending on how my opponent blocks, I can play the Amber Cleave or not. Uh, you know, I can activate the Oasis, uh, target something. Uh, I can just play Hotel Grey and pass. And I feel like, again, here, it pays off to be more conservative. Uh, I really don't want to expose myself to a bunch of, uh, you know, combat tricks. Because if I ever miss on what I'm doing, then the Ooze is just going to grow out of control. Right? If I attack and I play the Amber Cleave and uh, my opponent has a Braid, uh, then they'll kill the Amber Cleave. And all of a sudden, that Ooze is going to be, you know, a 6-6 six, six, uh, over the course of the Because a lot of creatures are going to die. In this combo, right? The questing piece is going to trade with the the spellbreaker, maybe. Uh, you know, the those are just going to grow bigger. Uh, so I think here it pays off to be conservative. You know, you have to look at your opponent's list, and he doesn't have a lot of instants, so there's not much he can do with the mana if I just pass the turn. And I'm really just waiting until either he makes a move uh, and taps out, so I get to kill him with the amber cleave, uh, or I draw a land to at least be able to attack with this mana, right? Uh, so I just play my Voltaic Brawler, uh, pump my Pal Collector into a 3 and pass the turn, even though I have 100 creatures I could attack with. right? I think it is correct to just pass the turn. And here something else happens that I think is very important, and that you're going to see, uh, you know, Kenny Kiro, he plays Grow Spiral, uh, doesn't hit a land drop, and does not use his Cabbage News. And I think that is really important. And why does he not use his Cabbage News at this point? He thinks for a very long time, and that is because he thinks the card I have in my hand could be Bone Crusher Giant, right? That is the only explanation for not using the, the Scavenging Moose. He only has one green mana, so if he tries to eat my Scavenging Moose, I can respond uh, and then deal two damage to his Scavenging Moose, which will then die, and then we'll have no chance. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know. Uh, but I believe that the only explanation for him not doing it is Bone Crusher Giant. So it is interesting for me to think that he's playing around Bone Crusher Giant uh, in his mind. Right, that, that is something that a card that he believes that I could have based on how this game has gone. Uh, and that, that will come into play actually later. So here is the key turn of the game. Right Now, yes, he, he drew a land, uh, he played another 4-4, four, four, and now it's, it balls back in my court. Right. So what do I want to do with that? Well, I could just pass again. Right. Uh, I could uh, you know, not do anything. 
Uh, but I think that's pretty loose because my opponent is now adding to their board and I'm not, right? Or I could just play a land and attack with the Mammoth, uh, right? But again, that also seems pretty loose because, uh, you know, my opponent can double block with the Spellbreakers and then, again, the Scavenging Goose is going to grow very big. Uh, I could attack with the 5-5 five, five Mammoth and the Questing Beast, which would get, you know, some of the job done. Uh, I would probably trade with the Questing Beast and the Ruse would, would grow bigger again. Um... Or I could do what I did, right? I also have the desert that I can use to target anything. Uh, but my play was to just use the desert uh, on the Burning Tree Emissary uh, and then play the Stomping Ground, right? And this uh, this does a couple of things. This presents a lot of power spread across different creatures, right? I could just pump my Trampler, for example, or I could, uh, you know, pump the, the Questing Beast to make sure it doesn't trade. Uh, but at this point, uh, I, I really want to threaten Lethal. And then I get to play the untapped Stomping Ground, which does two things. It lets me cast the Ember Cleave, uh, and it also lets me threaten Bone Crusher Giant, which is a card that my opponent already believes that I have. Uh, the next decision that I have here is, do I want to attack with my Pelt Collector or not? Right, Because I believe if I do attack with the Pelt Collector, my opponent's blocks are going to be... Uh, the Ooze is going to chump something, very likely. Uh, the Pelt Collector is going to get eaten by one of the Spellbreakers, and the Questing Beast is going to trade with the other uh, Spellbreaker. And so, what is the result of that? Well, the result of that is that uh, my Pell Collector will die before it has a chance to grow into a 4, which otherwise it would in Combat Summer for sure. Um, my Questing Beast will die, and my opponent will take uh, 9 damage, right? Which will put my opponent down to 2. Uh, now, this has me in an okay spot, right? I still have a couple creatures left. I still have the Ember Cleave in my hand that I didn't get to play. Uh, but, can we do better than that? Uh, like, do we have to throw the spell collector away? Right? Ideally, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to just throw a three three into a four four if we can help it, right? Uh, so, what does it? What do the attacks uh, look like if I don't attack with the spell collector? Uh, so, my, my opponent's blocks, I think, at this point, become very straightforward. They block, you know, four four into four four, four three into four four. So, the two creatures on the right, the questing piece of the, the brawler, who trade with two spell breakers, and then my opponent takes ten damage, uh, and they get the scavenging news uh, that they can then start growing. Right, uh, I think uh, this is not the greatest scenario for me. It's not necessarily bad. I still have four creatures, right? But they do have a very big scavenging use at this point, and they can start gaining some life. Uh, so I might not even, you know, if they have anything else, I might not actually kill them the following turn. Uh, so what is the best play? I think the best play involves attacking with the Pell Collector. And why is that? Because I think if I attack with the Pell Collector, I'll actually put my opponent in a spot uh, where they will not uh, feel comfortable going to two life. And why is that? Because they are already fueling Bone Crusher Giant, right? I, they believe I have Bone Crusher Giant in hand. That's what they did. They, they played last turn believing I had Bone Crusher Giant in hand, uh, and I, I still could, right? If I had the card in my hand, it's still in my hand. Uh, so we are, go to a spot where uh, my opponent might not feel comfortable going to two life. So because of that, if my opponent has an Aether Ghost, they might just use it before damage, because they could be scared of going to two life, they want to get rid of an attacker, at which point I will kill them with the Amber Cruise. So if they ever tap either of their, their lands, they're dead, right? If they ever do it before damage. Uh, they can also, alternatively, use their scavenging news. They can use the scavenging news that is jump blocking to exile something from my graveyard, uh, which will put them on three life and not dead to the Bone Crusher Giant, right? And then again, if they do that, I play the Amber Cleave and I kill them. So why is that different from the scenario when they are at one life, right? If I just don't attack with my Pell Collector and they don't block with the Ooze. Well, it's different for two reasons. The first reason is that the Ooze is not going to die in combat, right? Uh, and at that point, they don't have to use it before combat and I can't punish them with the Ember Cliff, right? They'll just use it at the end of the turn if they're going to use it at all. So I miss my window by not having the Ooze die in combat, as opposed to a scenario where the Ooze is dying in combat. They have to do it now if they want to play around the Giant. If they want to play around anything, right? If they just want to gain one life because they think that's going to be important down the line, uh, they have to do it. Uh, then they die. The second reason is that by attacking, not attacking with the Pell Collector, I might make it so that the only way they win the game is by using that scavenging news, right? It might become too appealing to use this scavenging news. Maybe they think, well, the Pell Collector didn't attack, uh, so my point. I'm going to have a 4-4 again, um, you know, in, in, maybe if I have Bone Crusher Giant, they can't win anyway, right? And at that point, they might just use the use to grow the use and gain into life and try to get back in the game because they see that as they're out, which is not that doesn't exist in the previous scenario because the ooze is, is guaranteed to die, right? So I might 
force them into a scenario where they cannot play around Bone Crusher Giant if they're trying to win the game. Whereas if I attack with everything, I can make them play around Bone Crusher Giant, which I believe that they believe I have based on how they've played. Does that make any sense? So I decided it was better to also attack with the Pell Collector after thinking for a very long time, uh, I used to go back and forth. Uh, I decide to attack with everything because I think in this scenario, it's it's the best combination of they're most likely to either use the Ooze or play Aethergust and leave themselves dead to the Embercleave. And if they don't do that, I, I'm still reasonably likely to win the game, right? I think I'm in an okay spot anyway, obviously. Uh, I, I could win this game regardless of what I did this turn, depending on what my opponent has in hand. Uh, but I, I believe this leaves me uh, the, the best uh, best chances overall, because these blocks are almost forced. They're not literally forced, but they're they're almost forced. Uh, and then, at this point, uh, I don't play the Embercleave. You see that I pass the turn very quickly, because if I do play the Embercleave, uh, you know, I let my opponent play the other Gust on the creature that I'm trying to target, uh, and then this could be a pretty bad turn for me, right? I, it could snowball into my opponent, you know, abrading my Embercleave in the future, or gaining some more life. Uh, you know, playing a different ooze or, or something. I, I don't want to expose this Embercleave now because dealing with the Embercleave will automatically mean my opponent takes less damage, right? Uh, you know, if I Embercleave the Questing Beast, they can bounce the, the Questing Beast and then their 4 4 stays in play, right? And, and it's just, it's, it snowballs badly for me, I think. So it's very important not to play the Embercleave, even though it's lethal, because you assume your opponent has the Aether Guest, which I have been assuming the entire game. So, uh, in the end, you see uh, what I wanted to happen happen. My opponent felt threatened enough by the 9 damage being at 2 life that they decided they had to cast the Aether Ghost uh, on, on the Brain Frame Sir, at which point I played the Amber Cleave and they died. So, why did I pick this game? Well, I think there were some key lessons here that, that we can take. Uh, the first lesson is that even though I'm playing an aggressive deck, I don't have to attack every time. Right? Uh, there were two turns in which I just didn't attack or didn't attack with as much as I could because I just didn't want to trade. Uh, and, and I think that's something that people just don't do enough. They see a creature with haste and they're like, must attack, uh, you know, must trade. Obviously, you're not going to attack into a bigger creature, but when you see a trade, it normally is good to take that trade uh, because you're clearing the way for your small creatures, right? So your 4-4 is only a 4-4. Your opponent's 4-4, it's holding down, you know, all your 3-3s. So at this point, you, you want to make this trade most of the time, but I think for this particular game, I didn't want to make that trade, uh, and I also didn't want to make it the turn after anyway. Uh, it also shows some patience in not playing the Ember Cleave because you assume your opponent has Nader Gust, which is a card that they could very reasonably have, and I don't want to get blown out by it. So here's two instances of you having to have patience to play a deck like this. Uh, the third thing that I think is relevant is the opponent not using the Scavenge News uh, on the, at the end of the turn when they had two mana up. And this is something that is key. You have to think, why did my opponent make this play, right? It's not a, not a normal play. A normal play would be to use your mana while you can, especially because my opponent didn't even have fifth land, right? So the fact that they didn't use it means they they believe my card could be Bone Crusher Giant. They believe it is Bone Crusher Giant because that's the only card they are playing around. So when your opponent makes a play that doesn't make any sense, especially if your opponent is good, it pays out to think, why is my opponent thinking that, right? You, you can't just think, oh, my opponent just made a mistake. Let's Let's move on. Uh, no, why are they thinking that? What can cause them to play this way? And the answer in this case has to be Bone Crusher Giant. And then the fourth thing is how to play the last turn of the game, which is how to use the belief that my opponent believes that I have Bone Crusher Giant uh, to make my opponent make the plays that I want to make. Right, so I played in a way where I would do exactly 9 damage, I would kill the use, so if my opponent wants to gain life or wants to stop an attacker, they have to do it immediately. Uh, at which point they, they had to tap out, and, and they died to the Embercleave that I did have, right? So it was a combination of things of using, uh, you know, understanding why my opponent fears that they're using my hand and using that against them. And just not just playing the Embercleave, you know, again, being patient uh, and letting my opponent act first, uh, at which point, uh, you know, I, I could just win the game with the Embercleave. That's what I have for today. Hopefully I was able to show you that even though Gruul is, you know, an aggro deck that just kills your opponent uh, very quickly, uh, it's still not a brainless deck, and you do have to make certain decisions over the course of the game. Uh, if you like this video and this type of video, make sure to like and subscribe. I plan on having a, a lot more strategy content in this channel in the coming weeks. Uh, and especially if you have an opinion about this particular type of video where we analyze gameplay or focus on interesting decisions that happen, uh, make sure to let me know in the comments, and I'll do it more or less depending on how people feel about it.